This video is about the Baroque period in music history. Um, the Baroque period started in the year uh, 1600 and ended in the year 1750. Um, in music history, we have um, ancient music, then we have medieval music, and then following the medieval period was the Renaissance, and after that came the Baroque period. Um, so really quickly, we're going to look at where the Baroque period came into being and how it came into being. Um, so we left off with the uh, medieval period, and we're kind of skipping over the Renaissance for right now so we can come back and get into it in some, in some more depth. Um, but the reason uh, that the Renaissance was able to happen, which was the uh, period in between the medieval period and the Baroque period, uh, was because of the Crusades. So this is a map of a lot of our crusades, and you can see that a lot of them go through this region of what we now know as Italy. Um, so there's lots and lots of money coming in here from the crusaders that are trying to come over here to the Holy Lands or Jerusalem. So what happens um, is that all of a sudden, um, things that were strictly just for people who were rich, like, you know, owning books or uh, enjoying music or being able to um, really see some of the finer things in life. Um, now it's becoming more commonplace for a lot of people. Um, so when they don't have to worry about how they're going to survive from day to day, they have more time to think about the arts and music and things like that. And this is really burgeoning in this area that we now know is, um, uh, Italy, especially in Florence. In Florence, or Firenze, in a, if you were in Italy, that's what you would call it, uh, was basically the birthplace of the Renaissance. Um, and so that's why a lot of the people that we associate with the Renaissance are Italian, like Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, basically all the Ninja Turtles. Um, so from there, um, we really see a lot of growth in um, in the Italian Renaissance, and that is what sort of spurs it to go across Europe. So after the Renaissance, which means rebirth, um, came the Baroque period, and that was when basically they took everything that was in the Renaissance and went crazy. Um, they wanted to make it more and more ornate or decorated. Um, they wanted to make it more complicated and more exciting than everything that happened in the Renaissance. So, again, this period started in 1600, ended in 1750, and it follows the Renaissance, which means rebirth, so kind of the rediscovering of the arts and literature and things like that after the medieval period, which was also known as the Dark Ages. Um, so during the Baroque period, um, we we're getting more extravagant, and the word Baroque actually means irregular pearl. Um, don't ask me how that's associated. I am still a little confused about that one. So during the Baroque period, music becomes more or ornamented or decorated. And this includes the use of trills to add more excitement to the music. So that blank right here is excitement. Um, trills are switching notes really, really, really fast. Um, and it's just kind of a really exciting decoration. I'm sure you've heard one before. Um, during the Baroque period, we started seeing opera, which is singers performing a story that is set to music. It's a lot like today's musicals. If you've ever seen a Broadway, um, it's sort of like a Broadway in that it's um, costuming and performing and staging and um, a whole lot of singing. <laughs> Um, the difference between something like an opera and a musical is, if you've ever seen a musical, there's a lot of kind of just straight talking. It's not all sung. But in an opera, even a conversation like, how is your toast taste today, um, even that would be sung. So everything in opera is sung. Um, so they're taking a story and they're setting it to music. These musicians who compose operas use a text, um, and that would be a libretto. So a story, uh, a book, any kind of any kind of a poem, something to where they have a basic um, literary literary outline for 
um, for the performance. So they take that text and it's called a libretto and that tells the story um, and it, the purpose of it is for entertaining. So um, we have acting and singing and scenery and costumes and even dancing, um, though sometimes that was frowned upon. So let's look down here in this one. Um, during the Baroque period there are two different kinds of opera. There's opera seria, which is serious, usually sad and involved people dying, and opera comica, which was light and comic. You see comic is kind of the root word of comica. And it, excuse me, it usually has a happy ending, more like a Disney movie than a tragedy. And opera spread across Europe to be one of the most important musical forms of the entire time period. It was something brand new and really exciting. So now we're going to listen to a little bit of uh, an example of some Baroque opera. You'll notice that they're playing modern instruments, so this isn't maybe really how it would have sounded. It might have sounded a little bit different. Um, but they are wearing uh, pretty close to accurate um, Baroque costuming, so things that you would have worn in the Baroque era, wigs, ridiculous dresses, all of that. So you can notice that they're speaking in Italian. I know it's kind of hard to understand um, if you've never heard opera before, um, but the difference between maybe opera and some of our more sacred music is that uh, a lot of the opera was sung in the language of the people. So not Latin like some of the church music. It was all in you know French or Italian, most of the time in Italian. Because like we were saying, that's one of the biggest countries in the Renaissance right now. Um, so next up, we see that um, we're talking about the Catholic Church again. Um, so the Catholic Church is still very, very important. And we have um, the Catholic Church involved in both politics, kings, queens, all that good stuff, and also in people's everyday lives. Um, so religion is very, very important at this time. And two of the most famous composers of the Baroque period, Johann Sebastian Bach and George Friedrich Handel, were both employed by the church and wrote tons of music for the Catholic Church. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach was actually not famous at all until long after his death. And uh, George Friedrich Kendrell was uh, kind of like a rock star at the time period. He had um, lots and lots and lots of music played and was recognized for it. Um, so we're going to listen to some of Bach's music and also some of Handel's music and some of the instruments that they performed on. Um, so here is Bach. Um, in some of So you may have recognized that. And then we're going to watch just a little bit about um, the harpsichord and how it works. They're plucked by these things called jacks. And what I'm showing you now are these plastic jacks. And each plastic jack has in it a little tiny thing that looks like a bit of like a guitar pick made out of plastic. So here, if I can point to it, that itself right there is the actual pick that I'm touching. Okay, so you see that um, in harpsichord, the strings are plucked. In modern day pianos, the strings are struck with a hammer. So in a harpsichord, when you press the key, it plucks the string. And in the piano, when you press the key, there's a hammer that hits the string. Um, so they have different sounds because of that. 
So now we're going to listen to um, Handel's Messiah. Part of it's called the Hallelujah Chorus. You've probably heard this before. that sounds familiar to you. Um, that's a very, very famous piece. So some of our other um, uh, composers, by the way, that's often heard, I'm sorry, around Christmas, also in churches, in movies, and uh, in commercials. Our other uh, Baroque composers are from across Europe, uh, Frescobaldi, Corelli, Purcell. Purcell is actually an English composer. Uh, Scarlatti. Um, so we have all sorts of, of composers uh, from all over. Now we're going to explore um, a couple of the Baroque instruments that are kind of precursors to um, our modern uh, wind and string instruments. So let's look at the viola di amore, which is really the viola of love. If you notice, it's thicker. It's got different uh, different shaped holes in the front, and all of those pegs are each a string, so that's how many strings this guy has. Can you imagine playing a 12 string instrument with your bow? Okay, this is the oboe di caccia. Okay, and the viol de gamba. I'm going to let this guy talk to you a little bit about this instrument um, because it's actually really cool um, and you can see it really well. Um, but it's a precursor to um, maybe the cello and the bass, more so the bass than the cello. And he's going to explain a little bit about the instrument to you. The viol de gamba was a six or seven string instrument. Um, the six string was popular in the Renaissance, the seventh string was added in the Baroque. The instrument is two and fourths with a third in the middle, so this instrument is a seventh string instrument. It has two octaves of A and two octaves of D, so A, D, G, C, E, A, D. The, um, it has frets, obviously. Um, the frets allow the instrument to have an open sound. The frets are made of gut, the strings are also made of gut, and the bottom three strings are wrapped. In contrast to the violin family, violin, viola, and cello, the instrument uses uh, C holes as opposed to F holes, uh, gamma corners as opposed to violin corners, flat back. Uh, the bow is held underhand as opposed to overhand, um, similar to violin, viola, and cello. And uh, the instrument is essentially the precursor to the modern double bass, um, which is also tuned in fourths, um, not fifths as the violin family. So based off of that video, you can really see how the viola de amor and the viola de gamba um, both are kind of direct relatives to the modern string instruments that we play today. Uh, maybe they're a little bit thicker than the ones we play today and have more strings. The, the holes may be a little bit different shaped. Um, you, but you also may see some modern additions like a chin rest on the viola de amor and an end pin on the viola de gamba. Believe it or not, when you play the viola de gamba, you had to hold it up with your legs. Um, and the way we hold the bow may be slightly different, um, but it's still pretty cool to see how our instruments are direct, directly related to these instruments. Um, so now I'd like for you to take some time and do these questions on the Baroque period. Um, make sure, please, that you answer them fully. I am very excited to see your Baroque period outfits. Um, I know you are going to do a great job of illustrating that. 
Um, if you would please make sure that this and the medieval page both get turned into your turn in box uh, with your name and your date on them. And remember, if I don't have them, I can't grade them. So thanks. Have a great day.